Hello and welcome to another episode of Cracking Addiction with Philippe Noren and Fergal Armstrong. In the episode of Cracking Addiction today, we're going to be talking about GHB or gamma hydroxybutyrate, but we'll also briefly touch on its prodrugs, GBL, gamma butyrolactone, and 1,4-butanediol. So Fergal, sometimes GHB is interchanged with GBL and 1,4-butanediol, but they do kind of interact in slightly different ways. Could you talk us through the differences between GBL, 1,4-butanediol, and GHB? Okay, so GHB is derived from GABA, as, as are the other two drugs we're talking about. And GHB um, is a agonist at the GABA-A receptor and a partial agonist at GABA-B receptor, and that's how it exerts its inhibitory function. Now, the other two drugs act in the same way as well. However, there are some differences. So in the case of uh, GBL, we know that uh, at, at lower concentrations, it's able to exert a greater sedative effect. So it's more potent milligram per milligram. And we also know that in the case of butane diol, we know that it's metabolized by uh, different mechanisms, including acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So it, its its effect can vary depending on the activity of that enzyme. And so it's less predictable. So uh, overall, they, they tend to act in the same mechanism, but they may have different clinical effects because of, of either different potencies or different kinetic metabolism rates. So uh, they, they are part of the same family and they can all be thought of as potent inhibitors of brain function. Absolutely. Now, something I found quite interesting in that in our lives as addiction medicine doctors, we mainly see people who use GHB recreationally. But GHB does actually have some medical mm. and clinical effects. Uh, could you expand a bit more about the, the yeah. medical indications um, and conditions that GHB has been used for? So we know that it's a potent GABA agonist, so it's a potent inhibitor of the brain, but it also increases the amount of slow-wave sleep that's uh, restorative sleep in the brain. And we, are, and as an indirect effect, that also then increases growth hormone. Now, in Italy, GHB is used as a drug for replacing alcohol, so it's a harm reduction intervention. So just as in Australia that we would use baclofen to reduce craving for alcohols in, 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 in Italy, they use GHB. And so you have GHB clinics in Italy. You just go and you get dosed and off you go for a week. The other medical indication is um, when we're talking about narcolepsy. And so remember, I said that it increases slow wave sleep. So narcolepsy is a disorder of sleep and it, GHB is used to treat or prevent the REM intrusion into normal daytime awakening and also to give people a good night's sleep at night. Now, the, the other indication for GHB, again, relates to sleep, and it can be used to treat fibromyalgia because we know that fibromyalgia is related to sleep deprivation, and people who have uh, poor sleep tend to experience worsening symptoms of, GH, of, of, of pain and fibromyalgia. And so... The GHB has been heroically, I would, I would argue, somewhat heroically being used to ensure sleep in those patients. And that actually is a, a, a known uh, reason for, for doctors to be prescribing GHB. Now, I also said that GHB indirectly increases growth hormone surges. And so therefore, GHB is used in the bodybuilding fraternity and misused in the bodybuilding fraternity to elevate growth hormone levels to increase muscle mass. So it has got a wide range of downstream clinical indications or, uh, or indications for misuse, as the case may be. But it all boils down to it's an inhibitory drug in the brain. Indeed. And I guess for some of the other um, areas that GHB is used, and probably more so in the areas that we see it in addiction medicine is sometimes it is also used as, as a stimulant recreational drug in lower doses, but also mm. sometimes yeah. as a chemsex drug as well, particularly in, in yeah. men who have sex with men. And that's frequently where it's used um, recreationally as well. It also, yeah. because it is colorless and odorless, has unfortunately developed a reputation as, as a, a date rape drug. It's sometimes... Um, mm 
put into alcoholic drinks to kind of hide its bitter taste. And we also frequently see it in, in, in those kind of settings. Would you agree with that, Fergal? Yeah, totally. And I think it's really important to also emphasize, sorry, I, th- I forgot to mention earlier, but a third action that actually is associated with dopaminergic firing. So on the one hand, it's a sedative because it's a, an agonist at GABA A and partial agonist at GABA B, but it's also associated with a dopamine rush, which actually is a stimulant. So it's got a biphasic action. Uh, and that's also, that also contributes to its uh, euphorogenicity and its use as a, as a drug of addiction. In, in the situations that you've already described, so we've got you know the, the date rape camp sex uh, situation as well as just pure euphoria. And with regards to, to how GHB is used, it's most commonly in Australia anyway used orally, but it can be insufflated, rarely injected, and also uh, absorbed mucosally. Uh, but when, when it's being used in, in more medical terms, as you've mentioned in Italy, it's, my understanding is it comes as a GHB uh, sodium salt. Is, is that correct? Yeah, it is. And it's also then dissolved into water. Um, but going back to the, to the, to the, to its use in Australia, I mean, it does, as you say, it does have this bitter taste. So I often think of it as the martini cocktail of, of, um, uh, misused drugs because I don't like martinis because they are bitter and there's too much salt. But for that very reason, GHB is actually mixed in with martinis, you know, so, you know, because it is so bitter, you can take, you can uh, detect the taste in your, if, if it's been added to your drink, if your drink has been spiked, if you're drinking something sweet. But uh, you can't really detect it if it's uh, in a martini. Yes. And I think one of the things that makes GHB so effective, but also dangerous is both the duration of effect and how quickly it it takes effect. Um, I've certainly seen numbers where the onset of uh, effect of GHB can be from 10 to 20 minutes from from, uh, usage. Peak usage um, can occur within 45 to, to 90 minutes. And the total duration of usage can, can sometimes be, or total duration of effect can sometimes be two, two to four hours. And this is from really small volumes of, of substance. And we're talking half a mil to, to a mil. And the thing to be aware of, as you said earlier, Fergal, when you were talking about GBL, because GBL is, is the pro drug, uh, you must not take the same dose of GBL as you would GHB because you could um, overdose. And sometimes with GHB, it's yeah. a half a mil or even 0.1 of a mil can be enough to, to, to overdose. Have, mm. have you seen things similar to that? Yeah, totally. So I think that the, do- the dosing is absolutely critical and there is a biphasic dose response. So at very low doses, it causes euphoria. Then at moderate to higher doses, it then causes drowsiness, respiratory depression and coma. And, you know, one of the key things about GHB is, is that it causes amnesia. So you don't remember that you've just got high or that you don't remember that you've just lost consciousness. Therefore, you don't think that drugs had any effect. Therefore, you take more of it. And so you end up in this ever increasing cycle of higher and higher doses to achieve what you perceive as a positive beneficial effect. And, Really, it's, it, I, I see a number of patients, very young patients, who, who misuse GHB and they think it's a cool party drug, but they don't actually see the effects of the profound sedation, which includes, includes loss of fecal and loss of urinary continence. So effectively, I say to these patients, well, do you think it's cool to lie in your own shit and piss? Because that's what it is, unconscious, lying in your own, potentially you're lying in your own vomit, your own shit, your own piss. Now, if you vomit, you really are in danger because you've lost your airway as well. But, you know, it is a profoundly dangerous drug with profound social consequences, which young young kids don't really get. Indeed. And as you mentioned, it has such a narrow therapeutic index. Um, a, a half a mil, yeah. even less than half a mil can cause an overdose and cause people... Yeah to yeah. get uh, significantly uh, obtunded, uh, be at risk of respiratory yeah. depression. But also, I, th- I think the, the, the concern is also of developing dependence. Um, could you talk yeah. to us a bit about GHB dependence and how easy it is to, to, to get dependent on GHB? Yeah. Well, I go back to my previous comment about the amnesia, so you don't remember that you've just got high. 
So that's one of the reasons why you end up with escalating doses. But really, it's very easy to get dependent on GHB very quickly. So tolerance is a, is a, is a big issue. There are a couple of hallmark uh, risk factors I, I use for dependence. If you're using every day, if you're using more than 20 mils, if you're using multiple doses throughout the day, so you know three to four times in the day, and if you're using at night, or if you're waking up to have to use at night, these are really high risk um, indications for potentially a high risk GHB withdrawal. And I suppose out of all of them, it's the total volume in the day. If you're using more than 20 mils a day of, of one milligram per mil, which is more than 20 milligrams, you're using 20 milligrams a day. That really worries me in terms of how dangerous is your is your withdrawal going to be? And I think the thing also to be mindful of is is two other things: is that GHB can have a stacking effect. So if say your first dose is one mil, you really need to be aware that the effects are additive, and that the next dose should potentially be a bit lower just to try and mitigate against harms. And also because GHB is such a short half life, people can go into withdrawal. You know, I've seen people go into withdrawal half an hour to forty five minutes. Um, uh, post post using GHB as well. So yeah. a, a, you yeah. mentioned um, waking up in the middle of the night or uh, yeah. I think it's called charging because people are getting to withdrawal at all hours. So people are waking up every few hours to use GHB. So yeah. it's, it's one of those uh, substances that really does take over people's life when they become quite dependent to it. And it's so dangerous where people can, as you mentioned, have seizures or fall into respiratory depression in, in withdrawal. So it's it's something to be aware of. Yeah, I, I liken uh, GHB withdrawal to alcohol withdrawal. And I say, look, GHB withdrawal starts sooner, is more severe and lasts longer than alcohol withdrawal. So it really is perhaps, I think, the most dangerous uh, hypnosedative withdrawal syndrome that, that, that we deal with routinely. But you also mentioned a number of other side effects uh, of GHB use. I mean, you mentioned seizures. You know, it does have a range of clinical presentations apart from hypnosedation. So do you want to talk a bit about uh, you know, what I would term as the GHB idiosyncrasies? With regards to the GHB idiosyncrasies, um, the main ones are it can be an irritant to skin and it can cause acute eczema. Again, as we mentioned, um, GHB has a really short half-life of up to 30 minutes. And so that is of concern. And that can be why people really need to use GHB quite frequently and will use it um, even during nighttime. Uh, it, it can cause uh, seizures as well, particularly um, over-ingestion of GHB as well as sometimes withdrawal. Um, there's also uh, the you can, with GHB usage, develop nystagmus, both vertical and horizontal nystagmus. Uh, we've also mentioned that uh, prolonged GHB usage can cause anemia, which can, again, increase the risk of overdose due to people not being aware of how much GHB they've, they've used. And also GHB can cause hypothermia as well. So those are the common um, GHB idiosyncrasies. And I guess... Coming off the idiosyncrasies. Sorry, I just wanted to make that point or emphasize the point that you said. It's really important to understand that hypnosedatives, in particular GHB, even in intoxication, can cause seizures. So when you're seeing someone with, who presents with seizures in the context of GHB use, it's not automatically a withdrawal phenomenon. Everybody thinks that seizures equals withdrawal, but GHB intoxication can cause a withdrawal. Sorry, GHB intoxication can cause a seizure, as can alcohol intoxication. So these hypnosedatives in intoxicating doses can cause seizures, even though we assume that seizures are a manifestation of withdrawal. So you really do have to be very careful because the management of GHB intoxication is not benzodiazepines. Absolutely. And I guess following on from that, Fergal, What's the acute management of, of GHB intoxication? Because it, it is one of those, uh, those things that we do sometimes see where people present intoxicated with, with GHB. So if you're watching in the community, the key thing to understand is that the management of GHB intoxication is to call emergency services because the, of the risks of that profound sedation and that profound risk to the airway and the, the risk to loss of life. And that's a really profound statement and something that we do really need to, to harp on about at how severe um, acute intoxication with, with GHB is. And I guess in this episode of Cracking Addiction, we've covered a lot. We've talked about GHB, 
it's, it's pro drugs, um, GBL and one for butanodiol. The dosing, the short half-life of GHB, the symptoms of intoxications and the role of supportive management in GHB intoxication. So we've covered quite a few areas and in the next episode of Cracking Addiction we'll expand on how to manage GHB withdrawal. So thanks very much for your attention on this episode of Cracking Addiction and bye for now.